Evil fills the whole podcast. The spirits ask you all to choose the horror films your hosts would view. Now Carter, Doge, and Jordan must satiate the monster's bloodlust. Their reckoning is overdue in the horror of Chugtober 2. Hello and welcome to Two Chunks in a Hunk. My name is Jordan Wonders, and this week, I'm the hunk. I'm Doge, and placebo means bull chunk. Huh? Are you are you quoting when he calls it a gazebo? No, Greta. Or when the lady tells him that it's uh, a placebo. Yeah. Right, gotcha. Yep, yep. And Carter, that is placebo, not placenta. I know that's I, been that's a, a my. Point I was of like, you said it wrong. <laughs> 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 we could talk about that later. I'm Carter. Which way to go? Spoilers, Doge. You call me by my name. I'll beep it. And what a nice chunk. Do you want it back? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't love that. Piped directly. <laughs> Your voice is coming on headphones, so it's coming from inside my brain. From inside the call is coming brain. from inside, inside the brain, <laughs> inside the gutters, inside the. My brain storm, is a sewer. Yeah, the you're storm exactly brain. Right. Yep, the storm brain. Jordan, oh, why are you? Yeah, Carter's that's good. So good. Why are you the hunk? If, um. Well, it comes a time in every young man's life. Or he has to, or yeah, that's true. There comes a time in every young individual's life. How about that? I like it. When they must make a decision. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Who are they going to be? Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to be a normie? Are you going to be the type of person who goes and buys six to 12 rolls of toilet paper <laughs> at a time so when you need it? so yeah, appropriately like, so. Yeah. Are you just going to go buy toilet paper when it's like, oh, we're almost out of toilet paper. I'm going to go buy toilet right. paper. That's what I'm going to do. Are you going to do, do literally what I did this week? Where I was sure. like, uh-oh, hope I don't have to use toilet paper soon because we're oh, having no. trouble. Run. Yeah, are you going to do that? Are you going to be that person who buys Frosted Flakes uh, a box at a time? Is yeah. that who you are? Or do you want a Tide Stick or a Tide Pole? Yeah, I sure. ask you that. Mm. Tide, tide Poles turn into frogs, which is exciting. They do. No, the... Throw into frogs. The decision, the decision must be made. <laughs> you a regular grocery person, or are you a bulk buys type person? Mm. This week I became a Costco member. Wow! Congratulations! Mm. Wow! And let me tell you, if I'm being real moment. with myself, I I'm going to go to Costco two to three times a year. <laughs> yeah, for real. But it will pay. The membership will literally pay for itself in those two. What's to three great trips. though? I'll tell you what you're going to love about it. And you might have already experienced this. Sure. But when you and the crew mm -hmm. are having a big road trip planned or something. Yup. Snacks. You got to get groceries when you get there. But just, just grab that. That's what it's for, man. Yeah. I bought what is just, we went to go get our membership cards and Callie had never eaten at the Costco, like little food court thing. So I was like, I got to go buy you a dollar fifty hot dog and soda combo. Sure. And then we also sure. got a slice of pizza, which was the size of a skateboard. But it was too much. Radical. Food. Hey, can I tell you this? Costco churro? Skip it. And then you know, I, I probably really. I probably yeah. am not surprised by that rating. Actually. I am a little, but it just feels like hot dogs and you churros. Think, they can't be that hard. <laughs> you think Costco be like, yes, I'll create the most authentic, delicious churro for you. Me, Costco. Authentic, no. Authentic, no. <laughs> delicious, yes. Um, I did Congrats, buy man. what is probably considered like an industrial trash can full of peanut butter pretzels. <laughs> All right. Oh <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> Those I are wish so I had it. Good. I wish I had it in here with me. The the container is comically large. It's like your Alamo Draft House popcorn bag. <laughs> and so, what, yes. And so, what I've realized about Costco is this, and then I'm done talking about Costco, which is, oh, you think you're done talking about Costco? Costco is bulk by Trader Joe's. They have all of this like Kirkland brand stuff that boasts to be better than the original, and it seems like a lot of it is. They've just got like specialized stuff that you can only get inside there, and it's all pretty good. So where would that? Uh, we're a Sam's family, okay. uh, and so where would that? A family, a family, uh, and and I thought the same thing. I will never use this membership; <clears throat> it, it won't be good. And then our, our first Christmas, Mary, my father-in-law was like, "Here's a Sam's membership. Just trust me." And he had that special kind of twinkle in his eye of somebody who knows more than I do. Sure, mm. and like they call it the holiday character. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. He was like voiced by Mickey Rooney. Yeah, it was perfect. Uh, and 
better than Ricky Mooney, I always say. Exactly. And now I I buy all my meat at Sam's at the beginning of every month. Buy it in bulk and freeze it, and then I've mm-hmm. always got it. But so where does that put me then as a Sam's a Sam's boy? Are we allowed to is this a Romeo and Juliet situation? I think Both so. like in dignity. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. It's it's more Pfizer Moderna. Like it's like a okay. I mean, one of you is probably gonna live <laughs> and sure. Yeah, sure. And the I, other from one my will understanding, be. the way it works <laughs> is that uh Costco is Moderna, I'm going to have stronger side effects. It's going to be more unpleasant in the long run, yeah. but it's going to last me longer. You know what I mean? You're going to have to get a Costco booster after a couple of months. Now, I'll tell you this. Yeah. I can see myself buying some electronics there because it seems like... I'll tell you, on Black Friday... deals. Black Friday, that's going to be your friend. It's a dangerous deals. place if you go in person, I'll tell you that. Yeah. yeah. On Black Friday, good Physically luck, dangerous and financially. See, I would think that because there's a bar, like a membership, that it's like a little more controlled. I thought like you meant club. a bar, like a drink bar. I was like, that sounds because like a bad a bar, idea, yeah. Costco. That would honestly be sick. Costco, That'd be great. take notes. That honestly, they would make even more money, probably. Shop tales. Casino style. Yeah. They just Someone's walking around. It's those old ladies. Now they have just free drinks, just platters of free Costco cocktails. is exactly. the number one supplier of wine in the United States. Isn't that crazy? I would have thought it'd be sense. grapes. <laughs> <laughs> Good joke. At first, I'm also laughing at my misinterpretation. At first, I thought you said Greg. Dude, like, I, I, oh, Greg. that's why I paused. I was like, who's <laughs> Greg? Then I realized you said Greg's, grapes. Greg's my wine guy. You guys don't know Greg. Oh, gosh, I'm going to send you Greg's number. Yeah, give me Greg's number. <laughs> Greg has the best wine recipe I've ever tasted. <laughs> Recipe. I'll tell you what, the most surprising thing is no grapes. No grapes, no grapes in it. Only Greg. This is a mustard based wine. <laughs> no grapes, only Greg. That's his slogan. <laughs> well, I guess we should probably talk about. Let's do that. What, what is this podcast for? Yeah. Uh, us to enjoy ourselves. That's and right. Make you new know friends. what? We're in control. I'd like to talk about the second place winner, third placed chronologically movie of our Chunktober 2 series voted on by you, our dear listeners. And that movie is, of course, known as It. It. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Doge, I'm trying to pace myself here. Doge, synopsis, please. In the spirit of all things scary... I bring to you boys this week a synopsis written by none other than longtime collaborator, zero-time listener, Nick Riganis. Nick. Nick. Hall of Fame. Ring of Honor. Undoubtedly. It's got to be a scare-nopsis. It is a scare-nopsis. You didn't say scare-nopsis. I did say scare-nopsis. Did I not say scare-nopsis? It's a (laughs) scare-nopsis. Undoubtedly. Something is going on in the once peaceful late 1980s town of Derry, Maine, as a seemingly endless string of violence, murder, and unaccountable child disappearances terrorize the small community. Against the backdrop of anguish remorse after the recent death of the innocent six-year-old Georgie Denbrow. The close-knit band of school pariahs, or the Losers Club. Georgie's troubled older brother, Bill. The bullied new classmate, Ben Hanscom. The ill-treated Beverly Marsh. The playful Richie Tozier. Homeschool kid Mike Hanlon. The asthmatic Eddie Kasprak. And the fastidious Stanley Uris. Pluck up the courage to confront their well-hidden childhood fears. And the blood-curling clown-like shapeshifter who lives in their twisted visions. Nevertheless, is the malevolent bright-eyed demon indeed a nightmarish creature that horrifies Darren? Either way, the otherworldly entity needs to feed, and the young team of defenders are no match for him. Do they have what it takes to face it? It was way longer than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, Nick Reganis doesn't do anything halfway. I love him. He really does write good. Yeah, they're very, they're actually very good. Um. Okay, so this is a genuine question. Yeah. How much do we want my 
personal knowledge and feelings of the book to play into this discussion. Uh, so I'm Jordan. I've read the novel. I love <laughs> reading because I I read a novel that actually the cloud is it not a cloud? He's a demon. <laughs> Dude, you have now, to stop doing the flood voice for nerds because it's killing me every time. Wondering, I don't know if you knew this, but I have read the novel. <laughs> I have a, a, an extensive collection of books in my library <laughs> at home. Got a lot uh-oh, of Stephen King. Uh-oh, Mario, I'm out of water. I think that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's interesting for you to share. I really do. Okay, well yeah. then let me, let me start with this. Um, we'll give you, you can have like about the next 35, 40 minutes and that's your part okay, of it. Me great. and Carter and will talk we'll, again at we'll, the end. So unsurprisingly to anybody that has watched a movie based on a book that they love, it's just different so that, I mean, like there's only so much you can fit into a two hour time frame from what is hours and hours and pages and pages of reading. Sure. You know, we've already had discussions with like Harry Potter and stuff of the difference when you're reading a book, you get, like internal monologues of people that you just can't get in a movie. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to try to avoid those kinds of differences just because that's inherent to the medium sure. difference. Sure. Here's what I'll say though. It is supposed to be a, like a limited release miniseries. It's, I think it deserves like a 10 episode run similar to something like Hill House where they really have a little more time. I, I don't even know that 10... Episodes is enough. This book is monstrous. I mean, it is absolutely massive. Um, But there is, there's so much there. But one of the best things about the book is that you're actually getting the child timeline and the adult timeline at the same Same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. So you're reading, hey, here's what happened to to Georgie. And then you're jumping forward 27 years and somebody named Stan is getting a phone call from somebody named Mike. You don't know either of these two people yet. And Mike basically says, it's time to come back. And then Stan kills himself. And you don't know why. He just writes it on the wall in his blood. And you're like, what is happening? And then we jump back and we meet Stan in school. And all these kids come, like, the the part, I, I would say like an important part of it is that the story is able to be told the way it is because the adults forget everything yeah. that happens. So when you watch part two, which we're not talking about that here, but when you watch part two, it doesn't hit as hard because you're not learning at the same time as the adults. You're like waiting for them to right. catch back up to where they were at the end of one. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I would say the biggest narrative difference is just the presentation. And I think this this does suffer for that. Now, here's mm-hmm. where I'm at. The it chapter one, this movie is the uh the sample that somebody hands you of the uh teriyaki chicken at the like Bourbon Street restaurant in a I mall thought food you were court. gonna say at Costco. No, no, no. <laughs> no, at the mall food court, and you're like, this is a pretty good bite of teriyaki chicken. I'll just go ahead and buy the whole meal, and the whole meal's the book. So it's it's not that it's bad, it's just like a little taste of everything going on. Okay. Yeah. But let me say this though. And then we can jump into like actual movie discussion, which is sort of our thing. No, I'm I'm loving Jordan's book club. It, the novel, is a cosmic horror story about an ancient, like eldritch god, basically, that crash landed in an asteroid on the earth and built up around it a town called Derry over m- millions, probably millions of years so that it would have a basically renewable food source of people who were felt trapped by this town, but also just kept having kids and like letting him feed every 27 or her. You hear that? Novel. Amer- I mean, if an eldritch guy can focus on renewable sources of energy, I think the least so we can do as America. human beings is focus on renewables, but that's um, a different podcast. I mean, podcast. come on. But yeah, <laughs> that, that's the novel. The movie It, chapter one, is about a scary clown who shapeshifts. Yeah. Yeah, I think we get some more of the Eldritch God stuff in It we, Chapter Two, we and do I'm realizing a bit. I like that more. I think in the, I think it would have been great to have these side by side. But yeah. honestly, I don't know if you get the cast you do for yeah. Chapter Two. No, if probably not. one wasn't completely. And the cast for Chapter Two, kids. the casting great. of the ki- I haven't uh, kids seen Chapter Two. Casting. Chapter Two was my I liked it more. Really, but, I do um, like uh-huh. it a lot. Yeah, yeah. Personally, I liked it more. But yeah, I guess we can talk about. The movie itself. 
Uh, I, dairy is the last place on earth that I would want to live. <laughs> yeah. Everyone is awful. Yeah. Everyone is awful. 100%. I've, I've never wished so much death upon fictional characters as I did just people that are like, you don't need to be here. Well, something that I think the movie does that's really good in, in like visual shorthand for something that Stephen King waxes poetically for pages and pages about in the book, showing the influence that it has over the town by just balloons appearing when horrible things happen. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a very good visual shorthand for like that, that scene when the couple drives by while Ben is being cut on the bridge. Yeah. That's in the book, but it's more like a, and it was an ominous feeling that made Ben understand that the evil permeated the town and the people to a point of apathy. I think here just having the visual shorthand of the balloon pops up and you're like, okay, there we go. Yeah. I think it's very helpful. Totally. I think this movie, and this sounds like a dumb thing to say. This movie is about the Stephen Kingiest movie. I think like it, it sure, there's something yeah. in in the script that they've done a really good job of translating because Stephen uh, to me a hallmark of a Stephen King book and I granted I have not read as many as Jordan has because I'm not a nerd but uh, <laughs> a hallmark <laughs> of a Stephen King book is like you start it and for the first 200 pages you're like this is too many characters <laughs> and right. there's yeah. just too much going on it is way too bloated and and I think that is um, that's a blessing and a curse, I think, because it mm -hmm. immediately feels like Stephen King, and that is a little distasteful to me. I I kind of tend to steer away from Stephen King books because of the bloat and the kind of he he's pretty well known for having the inability to to sort of wrangle an ending out of all the, the stuff he's put. Oh, this in the book. book has an ending. Um, but it's just I, I think it it. It really tracks pretty well with Stephen King's whole vibe. And my super dump for this movie is the script. Uh, okay. It is a disaster in terms of pacing. I uh, agree with that. Like this movie, I have no... There's it's not, pretty relentless, isn't it? Well, it's relentless and also the slowest movie of all time. <laughs> like it, it is simultaneously so fast and so much happening and so little happening at once. And I think it's probably because the story is intended to be like kind of deliberately flashback, flash forward, flashback, flash forward. And when you straighten it out in a linear timeline, it's like the events that happen to these kids don't really map neatly across any kind of act structure that we're familiar with for yeah, like watching any kind of, like it just, it doesn't work. The story doesn't work here. And, and I get that it's half of a story, but I think even the decision to like, let's move it forward. In the book, it's the 50s. In the movie, it's the 80s. And so we're intentionally going to go for this kind of Amblin, like it's scary E.T. vibe. And yeah. what we far, we're far more successful accomplishing with season one of Stranger Things than we were here. This does not, I, I feel like they aimed at Amblin and Goonies and completely missed it. Did you hear about that connection though between the yeah. making of this film and Stranger Things? So, yeah, I feel like we can't talk about that. This that would have been a different movie, things. I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, I but actually the, think they would have been more the, successful if it was the Duffer brothers doing this. Yeah. I yeah. think they they understand like the the tropes and the appeal of those kinds of Yeah. But hey, you know, real John happy Hughes, they got those, Stranger Things though. Yeah, I recently learned that Stranger Things was originally intended to be an anthology series which are just like a different monster, different weird stuff happening every season. Yeah. And that's, I would way rather have had that because I think two and three have been super diminishing returns from season one. Oh, I like three, I like a, three lot. a lot. Yeah. Three might actually we'll be see, my favorite four, season. Four, so four is far. coming out soon. Hopefully. I now, have almost okay. completely lost interest. It's taken so long. I, that's it my has spicy. Taken a very long time. That's my spicy take is that I think Stranger Things is pretty massively overhyped. Season one was awesome. Two and three were all right. And I am like, four could come or it could not come and I'd be just fine, I think. Uh, I disagree with you there, but that's okay. Um, I think the, so, okay, let's talk pacing real quick. So I think the biggest thing that hurts the pacing of this movie is the first hour. Yep. Because, so the, the story of it, like as written is, honestly huge and sprawling and everything's a little important. And so I understand the need to trim, you know, obviously for this. Um, but 
all of the kids being individually scared of something ahead of time is really important. I just don't feel like they had to devote like 10 minutes per kid. I think it's important in the novel, but I think we can cut it in the movie. I can say, I don't think I enjoyed it, but I think they had to do it. I think a lot about this movie went right, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I enjoyed it because of that. Sure. Uh, and our data is, you know, $700 million sure. for a horror yeah. film. Sure, sure. And one of the highest grossing horror movies of all time. And it was just kind of this, they hit my generation at a pretty good time because this yeah. came out 1990, you know, was our, our miniseries. And that just kind of became almost a cult classic, yeah. right? It's this, yeah. it's one of the seminal horror characters kids are dressing up as Pennywise ever since. And now it comes back. And we seem to do a lot of that with horror, this nostalgia. Sure. There's something about, yeah. like, for America, Halloween hasn't even been a big deal for, like, 70 years. You know, it's like it's it's like a a thing that we feel like we we put together ourselves. And so I think when It comes out, they had to do this. I think if people are watching the movie that read the book, uh, and again, you might be an outlier here, Jordan, but I think people that know the story or people that saw the miniseries, which, by the way, did have, you know, four or five hours worth yeah. of content— if you're not showing as many of the scares as possible, you know, this still still is doing some of its Halloween tricks. Sure. Not like Halloween the movie, but like it's a horror movie. This is what we expect. Yeah. And what's interesting is we're finding that some of the better horror or the horror that we personally like more that's modern horror isn't doing this. Exactly. It's not this relentless face opening alien eat your face kind of scariness. Right. Which is still really fun. Yeah. It's the slow build. It's a, I don't know if this is a horror movie. You know, right. if you get to the end of some of the stuff like Hereditary and Midsummer, right. and yeah, well, it's the difference it, between like so terror fun. and fear, right? Yes. Like it's yeah. it's the building, the mounting atmosphere of a Hereditary or a Midsummer, where it's just like it's mm-hmm. nothing in particular, but it's also everything in particular, right? And yeah. with this, it's th- a little bit yeah. more more I think overt. That with this, what we see a lot of. It, so first of all, uh, the vibe. I actually really like the vibe of this movie overall, which is this movie's almost all vibes because there's really not a whole lot of connective tissue overall to the movie, I don't think. But right. um, it also, this, I turned to Callie about midway through and I was like, this is the Fast and Furious of horror movies. <laughs> and by that, I mean almost all style, almost no substance. I really had a fun time watching it. I don't think yeah. it's a very good movie. But I really yeah. enjoyed my time yeah. watching this movie. The the scares here, I don't know if I want to call them cheap because that does feel derogatory because they work. I mean, they're working on me. I get spooked with some of this stuff. But it's just not, it's not as scary as other things. There is there is nothing relatable about this outside of being afraid of things when I was a kid. Well, can and I, can I tell you, to manifest. this is not my super dump, but it almost is. Um, One of the biggest mistakes this movie made to me is, and I understand he's iconic and it's a scary visual. Pennywise makes up like, Pennywise the Clown makes up like maybe 20% of the interaction that the entity has with the characters. Like, it's, the horror of it comes from the control and hold it has over Derry and the fact that it can manifest as anything. Pennywise happens a couple times in the book, but like, the fact that this is a movie about fighting a shape-shifting clown and not about fighting some unknowable force. And it is. I understand that it is and that two puts that into perspective a little more. But it's just like, and we can get into all, if you want, we can get into all the things that they, there's no way they could have put on screen from this book. Yeah, there's one in particular. Well, yeah, yeah. And I think that gets, don't get me wrong, it's nasty. But it's not, as big of a part of a book as everybody seems to think it is. I was looking online and everybody was like, what about that one scene? It's like, well, I mean, it's like, it's gross. It's Stephen King. He was on yeah, cocaine I mean, in the seventies. What do you want me to say? It's like, skeevy. It's, Stephen King it's, gets, I mean, he gets the allowance of, he gets a skeevy chapter or two per book. Sure. Sure. But mostly it's just like, I think we focus in so much on Pennywise that other scares fall by the wayside. Now I'll say this, yeah. this movie is the first movie we've watched for this, for Chunktober ever that has a scene that I won't watch, that I like look away from the TV. What is it? It's the painting lady. Mm. Oh, that's She's, so scary. She, the visual of her scares me, like freaks me out so bad that I, I don't watch when she's on the screen. Like I, mm. 
I, she's really I have scary. To look she's away. one of the scariest things to me about. So did you know yeah. that that's an actual, like they initially wanted to just have some slight facial disfiguration. And so there's a live yeah. performance there on set with like prosthetics and like all that stuff. Right. And then it just, they kept pushing it farther and farther and farther in post to where right. she's almost entirely digital. Mm. I think that, yep. I don't know, man. Like I just, I'm coming at this movie with, I came at it with a weird heat at a weird time, having just watched both Hereditary and Midsummer for the first time, two episodes away from finishing our first ever watch of Hill House. And yeah. then and then it shows up and it's like, it's me, the scary clown. And I'm there's like, no subtlety I, I whatsoever. Yeah. I don't think that it is actually the scary clown. Mm-hmm. It's just the it's I don't know. It just felt kind of silly to me while I was watching it. Like, I think very you little can sum of it up actually why this doesn't work as scary with the leper. Yeah. Who is like so, so movie magic grotesque that it stops being scary because it's like, well, this is just too much. Well, to me, it's like if we're intentionally going for that, that Amblin, kids ride our bikes everywhere. We shine our flashlight directly into the anamorphic lens. Like that is such a very specific style of filmmaking and a specific era of film that we all remember. And most people our age have some sort of immediate visceral childhood connection to that. Right. Then let's let's really lean in. Like let's get Phil Tippett in and design some really gory, gross prosthetics and like right. let's do it like we would have done it then. And then mm-hmm. like really lean into that. And I think that like then to me, it's like if it's a nasty prosthetic of this leper, or if it is like some horrible, horrible uh, like animatronics for the painting lady, I think it works a little better and scares me a little bit more primally like something I would have seen in, you know, in like Gremlins or sure. you know, like something sure. out from yeah. that era. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I'll go ahead and super dump. And uh, this is, get your flood voice ready. I knew this was coming. We, um, similar to my issue with Pennywise being the main focus of this movie rather than the entity of it itself being the main focus of this movie, we have completely butchered almost every character. <laughs> in, the, in the novel, every character is way different than they are in the movie. <laughs> I was trying to. You know, I, I chose not to bring my reference list um, with me. I'm specifically going in to zero in on um, Richie, Mike, and Bev with Mike standing out in particular. So oh, Bev no, is Richie, not- Mike, Richie, Mike, and Bev are not the way I like to read about them in <laughs> my favorite book of all time, Id. Id? Get out of here. <laughs> Bev is not damseled in the book. She goes okay. down as part of the team to fight it because they want to protect their town and stop kids from disappearing. They're not yeah, like, we got to go get Bev. She's a pretty classic example of fridging a female character for male characters to grow. Even even in the adult timeline, that thing where she sees the, the lights inside of Pennywise's mouth, that's kind of yeah. something that happens later, but it happens to a completely different character. It actually happens to Bill's wife, and she's barely a character in the second movie too. So they change a lot of that there as well. Um, but yeah, Bev is pretty hamstrung in this um, as just sort of like a love interest for two people to have a love triangle around instead of like a really integral part of the team. Yeah. Um, Cause the, the book is very specific that the fact that there's, they have all found each other is like mystically important, not just like they have good friends that it's like something about the combination of their personalities and stuff is what lets them be it. Um, there's also uh, a cosmic turtle named Maturin that protects and fights. Uh, it's a whole thing. Don't even worry about it. He does pick up a turtle Lego set off his brother. Yeah, it's floor. a reference to Maturin. Basically, the, hey, it's Maturin. The, the anti <laughs> it. to play. Or it's out Gonna training shoot up a face. clown now. Gonna help save the day. But, uh, <laughs> it's a very Let's good reference. Let's all have sex. <laughs> so hold on I'm only a third of the way through the super dump I'll go faster I promise oh my gosh I'll go faster I promise we can add some classical music in the background yeah Yeah, sure don't vote for the movie if you don't want to hear it get talked about Richie um, Richie just has a much more vital role than just like being the jokester in the books Richie is one of the only two people that is actually able to fight it with Bill um, and is one of the only two people that's able to figure out his origins as like a 
ancient alien being that crashed to Earth. But beyond that, Mike is the most egregious example of why on Earth did you do this? Mike's story is completely changed. Um, in fact, I would say that he's an afterthought in this movie when he is arguably the most important character in the book. It's it, the, the novel is al- almost not, uh, narrated by Mike, kind of. Um, Mike is the historian in the novel, not Ben. I don't know why they made Ben the one that knows everything about dairy. It's Mike in the books, which is why it's so significant that Mike stays behind to stick around in the town and see if he comes back 27 years later. Like Mike is, there's a lot of elements of Mike's story that involve like the racism in the town because the town is so fueled by the hate of it and the evil there. Like, it's kind of There's, unbelievable to me that that was completely glossed over. That's what I'm saying. Like Mike's yeah. story is so important. He's my favorite character from the book. He is so interesting. interesting and he is it's not even the same character here. Like they have the same name. That's it. Like even so, his I, his parents are alive in the book. They made up the whole fire thing for this. Yeah. The fire the fire from the movie is something of a club that was burned down in the book. Like it's a whole thing. Supposedly though, this is one of Stephen King's favorite adaptations, right? Is it He's not? He's got to say that his? so that he can make that residual money. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's making were it. it not for this, there wouldn't have been more attempts because his sure. stories to screen were on the down slope. Yeah. But we got a new pet it's cemetery out of this. We got the HBO 100%. Outsider show. Yeah. Yep. I think... So that's confusing to me then because having not read the book, there is so much about this that it's like, why'd she see the lights in his mouth? Why did right. this happen? Why did this happen? There are happen? so many things this in this happen? movie that when you've read the book, you're like, it's weird that they only did a little bit of this. And so if you haven't saying, read the book, like, it's like, why did they do any of this? So who's it for? Because right, it doesn't exactly. work for me, a non-book boy. It doesn't work for Jordan, the book boy. In those well, and instances. When, like, when Pennywise says, beep, beep, Richie out of nowhere, does that mean anything to you? No. That's an oft repeated line. When Bill is walking up to the house and muttering under his breath, he thrusts his fists against the post and still insists he sees the ghost. Does that mean anything to you? Not at all. No. It's so wild to me that they have made this movie and been like, we're going to throw in Easter eggs, but the Easter eggs are the most important parts of the story. So nobody can understand. And the people who love the book are going to be bummed that that's the only way we include it. Yeah, like that's like, <laughs> right. it's, it feels like it's, it's for nuts. people who are aware of scary clowns as a concept. But That's not folks it's who, not, yeah. I, I, sorry, Carter, go ahead. No, it's it's not super similar to my experience of seeing Fellowship of the Ring in theaters, but there definitely was people at the end when they're just, it's Sam and Frodo and they're just kind of looking out and really nothing has happened to progress yeah. <laughs> outside of the Fellowship joining and deciding what they're going to do. They don't do anything after that. And uh, I remember someone in the theater being like, what? Like just yelling <laughs> like, this is it? So somewhere along the line, they didn't catch all of the stuff that said, hey, this is three parts. <laughs> and so they were like, that's it? It's over? Um, I don't think that's necessarily the sense here with it. But I haven't read the books either. Uh, and there was a bunch of stuff that I was like, what on earth yeah. is going on? Yeah, but Pretty much, for the most part, that's what's so weird is like, for the most part, anything you saw that you were like, huh? Probably is like yoinked from the book for real. Mm-hmm. Just so out of context Mike's, and with no helpful information. My, I read on IMDb, my, is it Mike whose big fear is mummies from the like the 1950s mummy movie? The, uh, I think that's, I don't remember. Mike's regardless, big thing is a bird. <laughs> regardless, it the scary clown turns into a mummy at one point, which is something they deliberately eliminated from the beginning of the movie, but then at the end of the movie, he becomes a mummy and wraps his his toilet paper around somebody's head and starts to try to eat them. Do we remember right. this? Yes. Yeah. That's a, a clear example of like, hey, what on earth are you doing? Because now that doesn't make any sense. Why is he a mummy now? Has he also seen Brendan Fraser's The Mummy? Like, what <laughs> what is his deal? Why is he turning right. into... Right. It's just, I don't know. It just doesn't really hang together for and me. And if, if you want to update the scares to the 80s, make it a bunch of things that they would have been afraid of in the 80s. Make him turn into Michael Myers. Make him turn exactly. into Freddy Krueger. You know, like those kinds of things. Yeah. If you want to exactly. make it like a an updated version of being If you're going to do a love letter to movies from that era, go all out with it. You right. can't go halfway with it. <clears throat> right. And if you want to make a, an it adaptation that is basically just like this, ha- this, 
town is haunted by a clown that can transform. I guess that's okay, but they clearly wanted to do more because yeah. they have the deadlights in this movie and they continue it in part two. You know, like it's just, you can't have it both ways here. And that's the thing. It Stephen King describes it as there's haunted house stories. It is the story of a haunted town. Okay. And it's really unique in that way. Um, even to the point where like in other non-it stories, characters in some Stephen King novels will like drive through or pass through the town of Derry and be like, let's get out of here. This that was the most evil. That is among the most exhausting things that Stephen King does. Being like reading another book and then being like, oh, I don't remember what book I was reading, but the monster in it or the dark entity or whatever was like, play, like I'll take hold of everything in Maine except Derry. That town's taken. And it's like, all right, King, I don't want to read the clown one. I'm not interested in that one. <laughs> I just want yeah. to read this one. It's so funny yeah. though, because whenever I, re- because I like a lot of Stephen King stuff, whenever I read stuff that's like, do they talk about it? <laughs> yeah. like it. I've read that. It's like seeing on a bag of Fritos scoops that, hey, this would go really well with ranch dip. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's like, I should have bought some like, of that. Also, I guess. by the way, yeah. <laughs> we have our own brand of ranch. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I totally agree. <laughs> hey, it is time for uh, uh-huh. chat announcements. So let's, let's, do a little bit. Welcome to Shout Announcements. Part of the show where we give shout outs and make announcements. Shout out my favorite French Canadian, your favorite French Canadian, Denis Villeneuve. Timothy Chalamet. Celine Dion. Um, My fault. Ooh, yes. Uh, We have been talking about this day for more than a year. Have we not? Yeah, it feels like it probably. Maybe close to two years, it feels like. This is a really important moment. I feel personally, we've talked about it in our Discord, shout out Discord, that $5 tier on Patreon. We have talked about how this needs to do really well in theaters. Meaning really well these days means makes a lot of money. It did really well, right? But you're finding out maybe in the first half of our episode that we don't really like the movie very much, but it made $700 million. So here's It Chapter mm-hmm. 2. We, I, From what we know from Denis Villeneuve, there's going to be more Dune movies. Um, but we're going to see that. I bought my tickets. I'll be seeing it at IMAX mm. uh, Thursday night. And then that next morning, we'll finally be reviewing Dune. I feel like I'm going to be nervy. I'm definitely going to be nervy. Nervy to see it. Yeah. I'm definitely going to be but nervy. Jordan and I have looked at the Rotten Tomatoes score sure. right now. Doge chooses not to. Yeah. I want to go in completely uh, blind. If you've, like if you've enjoyed... Uh, if you've enjoyed us making fun of Jordan for reading a book we haven't read, then be sure to tune into that Dune episode because I'm sure there's going to be a whole lot of Jordan reading a book and saying the book did it better. So I've read it too. So Oh, you've read it too? You'll be the only one, yeah. Oh. It's the reverse of us talking about a Disney cartoon from the late 90s. I love the world sure. where the guy that has an entire uh, mental library of Greek mythology is calling me a nerd. <laughs> I we were doing the same dig, but in very different ways. I was talking about Hercules that I remember because of Michael Bolton, but he remembers because of stuff that happened before Christ. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! But yeah, we'll be reviewing that. We're taking a little. Uh, it's a little chunktober break, even though there's still fear involved. I'm very afraid yeah. that this. Uh, there's any chance that this isn't good would be devastating to me. So I yeah, really hope. I am afraid. Yeah. I hope Hopefully that it unfounded, well. but I am afraid that it will be Denise's first ever not incredible movie. Mm. And I don't think so. I don't think so either. I mean, I, I think the quality of the movie's never been in question. I just, its appeal is a question mark to me. Sure. It's not a traditional blockbuster time of year. And I don't know, man. It's just, it feels like post- Post like pandemic shutdown of the theaters, everything is just like a who knows. Yeah, okay. we'll see. I mean, Venom, let there be carnage. It's almost made three hundred million. So, yeah, it's because of the post credit scene alone. That's true. We'll be back uh, after Dune to finish out Chunktober, and then we the have first week really, in November. Really excited. Yeah, that's how spooky Chunktober is. It just spills out wherever it wants to. Um, we got something really exciting planned for after Chunktober, but we're gonna get the. To the chest on this one. Yeah, if you if if you are enjoying us roasting Jordan for reading it, I think 
I think I probably have yeah, my dudes dude. coming in our final series this, oh, this year. For sure, you're going to get dunked on. For <laughs> sure, you're going to get dunked on. Some coffee's fast, but not fresh. Some coffee's fresh, but only after a long wait. Speedway coffee is made fresh at the push of a button, hot or iced, so you can have fresh coffee your way, right away. Find a store near you at speedway.com slash locations. Hear that? Is that America cheering or a sausage patty sizzling to perfection? It's time to cheer for Egg McMuffin and fresh cracked eggs at McDonald's. It's time to wake up to the aroma of freshly baked biscuits and treat yourself to a real honest-to-goodness morning meal. Breakfast, it's on at McDonald's. Now enjoy a large iced coffee for just two bucks and a breakfast sandwich to make a meal. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal. It's time to be positive about this movie for a moment. Oh, I'll super Let's pump. Let's do it. I'll super okay. pump. Yeah, please. I don't mind doing that. I'm not afraid of super pumping. And the fact that you would suggest that honestly is pretty personally ruinous. My super pump is Jaden Martell. Who plays Bill? Dude. He is he's amazing. fantastic. In yeah, this. he's really good. Are you good. kidding me? He's so good at this. And I think that ooh, none of the other kids are really all that great besides him. Oh. I disagree. I think he is yeah, my absolutely s- fantastic and displays nuance and displays layers. That's why he got knives movie. out, baby. Exactly. In a movie of cardboard well, cutouts, he got, he's a 3D uh, boy. What is line. the... There's a movie he's in that I've actually seen that's really good, and I forgot it was him because it was one of his first big... Midnight Special? Yeah, Midnight Special. Another Midnight great Special movie with him rules. in it. I haven't seen it. Very good. Yep. Uh, I don't... I hope I'm not interrupting your super no, pump. that's but it. Mine, we share some of it, but I have to say, because of what you said about the rest of the cast, contradicting my super pump, that I am, I do like just the kid casting as a whole. Mm. While I would rank some, it's a lot easier for me to say the kids as a whole than just like these four. Um, But I think they did a good job with that. I really do. And I think there's a lot of other things to compare it to. Um, because a lot of great, I, I think Spielbergian things to do are to have your cast basically be all kids. Um, and I think this collection was good and it felt like it was a thoughtful, uh, while not thoughtful to the book, they tried to pick some kids that that kind of fell into place. And I think they did a great job. Sophia uh, Lillis, is that her mm-hmm. last name? She's, I really do yeah, like I her. Do. And I think she did a great job. I think she's great. Uh, and, and I obviously love Jaden Martell. Uh, I was kind of, I like Finn Wolford way more in Stranger Things than in this um, because it was just relentless. He, he, his joking was as relentless as the scares in this and it was a yeah. little too much. Uh, big fan of Jack Grazer. I think Jack Dylan Grazer as Eddie yeah. was really, really good. Eddie is uh, my favorite kid in this movie. Yeah, he was, he was funny. He's uh, actually he's really funny. In Luca. He's Alberto in Luca. Oh, cool. Just recently. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I, I guess, so, so let me just come to the defense of these beautiful children. I I think perhaps the thing I have a problem with is the writing of these kids rather than the performances themselves, now that I'm thinking about it. Because I do like, like the kids do a good job. They're just, yeah. the only one given anything to really work with is Jaden. Sure. Anyway, continue. Jaden Smith, I mean, if our eyes aren't real, how can mirrors be real Jaden Smith? But anyway, continue. Oh my gosh. <laughs> no, I'm done. I mean, that, like my super pump is all the kiddos. My super dump is it they just go too too evil with some characters in here. <laughs> it is and again, I understand now more, uh, but it doesn't change my opinion about my super dump. I do understand that essentially Derry is of Pennywise's creation. Not necessarily Pennywise, whatever the entity right. is. I think Pennywise is just one of the many Correct. forms of this God. Um, but like specifically the bully. Yeah. Henry like the Bowers. bully in this is an unrealistic. Completely. I mean, maybe this is just my, my, my own ignorance here, but I mean, we're cutting kids up. Maybe the reason he's not going to jail is because his dad's a cop. And yes, I see. Uh, I think they gave us a moment where we need to, get closer to understanding why he's that sure. way or feel sorry for him. And it doesn't nope. do that for me. I'm like, great, kill them both. Yeah. Anyways, eat their faces if you would. Like I I was just not- Add Henry Bowers to the it. list of characters that have been butchered by this movie adaptation. Well, I would imagine so. But it's like, 
it's absolutely rabid yeah. of a like bully version and it was just unbelievable so patrick hockstetter the guy who is killed in the sewer the tall skinny friend with the lighter in the uh, yeah. the looks hairspray. like looks like human max goof nice yeah, yeah that's very funny. good so to go back patrick's character is the older friend of the group of bullies in the book has a lot of influence over them. And Patrick displays like serial killer type tendencies as a young boy, like kills animals and all that stuff. So he's the real messed up one. Henry is definitely a bully. The cutting scene does happen in the book, uh, but it's the fifties. The outsiders was big. They're stabbing people. Um, but Henry does not go off the rails psychotic until the moment that he becomes like possessed essentially by it. And then yes, he does kill his dad. That does happen. His dad's a farmer in the book, not, or like a, yeah, I think a farmer, not a cop. But yeah, he, he, there's a point where he like is fully influenced by it and like promised power and all this stuff. And that's when he goes for real off the rails. And in this movie, it's like from the beginning, they were like, what if he's crazy the whole time? If just crazy, if I'm he's a, just crazy. If I'm a script editor, I'm suggesting we cut the bully for the movie. I get, I get all the book, the book folks yeah. love him. He's a big well, deal. The whole don't point him in the of movie. Henry in the book is Henry is a physical threat that is kind of hunting them while they're hunting. Like it is using Henry to try and keep them away from him. Yeah. And in this, we, it's just like definitely not the purpose the of this. Yeah, exactly. Right. He's just a bully because it's, we're, we're shooting for that, that John Hughes, <laughs> that Goonies. We got to have a bully because those have sure. a bully. Sure. Yeah, I totally agree. Which I, I mean, I'm dogging on that choice. That's a that's a pretty inspired choice to like see that kind of vibe in the original text of the '50s kids. Like to see, hey, we could turn this into something convincingly Am- Amblin esque. Like, sure, that's a, a pretty cool choice. Creatively, he, just, he had no layers, and I don't need layers anywhere. But when I can point to like a Velociraptor being a, a better bully, than, <laughs> sure, <laughs> it's just like yeah. I was thinking of Jurassic Park for some reason. Uh, because I think they wanted it to have some kind of nostalgia, because there's a big point to that. I think even when the story is about being young and then being old and remembering the things when you were young, it's almost a meta-nostalgia in there. uh, And obviously a horrifying I'm going to hold on to my super pump for just another minute or so, because I want to talk about sort of the the side scares in this movie, um, which are some of the more effective scares. Um, Specifically, if I could hone in on two moments. One is the TV program that Henry watches that tells him to kill his dad. Yeah. It's on every TV in the town, it seems like. Bev's dad is watching that. Yeah. When she comes into the house and he's asleep right before all the blood. And the TV yep. is describing out loud how to get down into the sewers. Mm-hmm. When she walks in, the TV's like, and that's going to lead you straight to where all the sewer pipes connect. Like the lady is like, talking those moments i'm like there's clearly some brilliance happening here you know yeah carter you good nana do bad girl don't bark when daddy records you know that come here come over here to go around the other thing and both both of these actually add up to me to what this movie should have done to show how scary dairy is scary dairy Mm. because the other one is I hope you both noticed it. It it was made a big deal after the movie released. The woman in the library that stares at Ben behind him while he is reading the book. Carter, did you notice this? That she was staring? There is an older woman in the aisle behind Ben when the librarian gives him the book on Derry's uh-huh. history. Yeah. Who like uh-huh. turns, she's blurred out in the background, but she just like starts to smile and like hunch over and just stares at him with really wide eyes the whole time he's reading. And then when he turns around, she's back to looking at her books again. I think this is how we should have been showing that Derry is a haunted place. With weird background happenings like this. Not with blatant, over-explained things. Because like the history of Derry being an incredibly violent place is important. But to show the active haunting of the town... Things like that are very effective to me. Like the, sure, the stuff where you have to watch it program. twice to be like, wait, what did I just see? Yep. yep. Yeah, totally. And those moments are really great. And those are the moments when I'm watching this. I think this is my fourth watch of this movie just because I've shown it to a couple people and watched it on my own. 
I think those are the moments where every time I start to trick myself into thinking it was a better movie than I remembered that it was. <laughs> and then yeah. I'm like, oh, actually not. Um, I was super yeah. pumped though. For real. Yeah. It's Bill Skarsgård. Yeah. We haven't even talked about him yet. Yeah, I was saving it. I'm surprised nobody else brought him up. I was saving it. He's so good. Yeah, he's really, really good. And as much as I hate that this movie has reduced Pennywise to scary shape-shifting clown, if we're going to do it, Bill Skarsgård's the way to freaking go. He is so spooky. His performance is amazing. All of his drool and his eye thing that he does, he can do that in real life. Yeah. Yep. The That's eye crazy. thing he and the smile for the role, didn't he? are both him. Did you see it was down to Skarsgård and Willem Dafoe for this role? Oh, uh, it was going to be Will Poulter for a little bit. It was after Will Poulter. Will Poulter naturally has Pennywise forehead, which yeah. I'm interested to see how that looks in Guardians of the Galaxy. But uh, yeah, it, after after Will Poulter dropped out, it was between Skarsgård and Willem Dafoe. <laughs> Could have been very interesting with Dafoe. Could have been uh, weird actually. with Willem, right? Yeah, probably. I just think Bill Skarsgård is so... Um, they also had Hugo Weaving. Yeah. I didn't know that. And he just couldn't pull off. Maybe that's who I'm like thinking funny. of. Maybe it's Hugo Weaving that I'm thinking of. Maybe I invented it. It was Hugo phone. Weaving, yeah. was one of them. Yeah. No, they, it, it, the difference was that Bill Skarsgård was able to do kind of the quirk and the playfulness. Mm-hmm, that's right. They needed it to be scary and also kind of quirky. Yeah. And they were like, Hugo could just only do scary. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which I get it. I just think he's, um, he's really fantastic as, Pennywise, I think that he does totally ride that line of like, I'm a goofy clown. And then also like, I'm going to eat your face. Like it's so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> weird. And like the effects that they choose to do on like the dancing and all that stuff is very cool where they keep his head centered and stabilized while everything else moves around it. That's all very looks unsettling. Like, I mean, they had no way of knowing, but that looks like a TikTok now. So it's like a little <laughs> less effective. You know what I mean? Like I've seen yeah. people do that all throughout the pandemic. Of like yeah. stabilize it to their head and it's like, oh, well, that's kind of, a, that's what this looks like. Yeah, it's a good point. <laughs> um, yeah, he did good. He's got only four lines, or four lines. He's got four minutes of of actual like dialogue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it felt like Bill was was meant for that role because he was just like, oh, I can already yeah. do that. <laughs> Even after they <laughs> hired, his, like you said, with the eye thing. His mouth, his weird creepy smile he can do. The, his His physicality is really great. Like, yeah. The bow he takes once he has the fence post through his head and his eye and mouth is all messed up and he like does the bow while he walks out of the room. He's yeah. definitely a creepy Pennywise. Like he does a good yeah. job being very spooky. Um, Tim Curry likes it too, by the way. I don't know if we've seen this. Tim Curry is like really happy with what he did with the character. Yeah, I'm sure. P- I, to me, Pennywise is the, st- Pennywise the clown, not the entity of it, but Pennywise the clown is like the standout, like, yes, c- congrats. There won't be a better version of this. Yeah. Um, I think it's really well done. Um, I'm sure we all know the story, uh, but what's the kid's name who breaks his arm? The hypochondriac kid. Eddie. Eddie. We all know the story of him. Like that's the first scene they shot together is is Bill Skarsgård screaming at this kid and like about to eat his face. And in between takes, Bill's like, hey man, you're doing okay? You're doing a really good job? Like you're-, you're I did love hearing about yeah. all about how Bill is he's making like, sure so the kids are okay the entire he's like, time. You're okay, you're doing a really good job. He seems so nice. Like, I want to make yeah. sure that you're acting scared. You're not actually scared. I can dial it back for this take because cameras will be pointed at you. And the kid's like, no, I'm great. I love what you're doing with the character. Really great choices. Let's take that again from the top. <laughs> <laughs> all the interviews I've seen with Bill Skarsgård seems like he's a legit sweetheart. Like seems like yeah, he's a really totally. good dude. I'm a, I like totally. that a lot. He really, yeah. He feels- <laughs> Super. I nice. love that. Um, the final showdown. The only talented person in that family, though. That's what's. Important. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. A random spicy take. That's every an scars guard is a Speaking of Dune, dunk, dude, we're seeing this right before we see Danny. Yeah, another scars guard. And the 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 older brother is it Alexander? Yeah, who was mm-hmm. we saw him in Godzilla vs Kong earlier this year. Big Little Lies. He has two. Is what I know. Him Bill from. has two older brothers. Yeah. Um, he also has a brother who plays Loki in. Uh, I believe his name's Loki in Vikings, which oh, is a, fun. a great show. I think people should give a That's shot. Cool. Vikings happened to come out around the time of things like Game of Thrones. Got buried yeah. a little bit. People put a lot of energy in something else, but Vikings is worth Lastly, it. I think Game of Thrones was totally worth all that energy we invested it, in it, though. Right? Paid off in a really satisfying way. This is just for my book, people, and I'm only saying this really quickly so that they'll be this like, is I'm spe- glad he a said a special it. shout out to the library boys. I'm going to need to memorize some lines from Super Mario Sunshine so that I can have you... <laughs> 
compare and contrast. But Mario, you got to change the nozzle to get that <laughs> box. That's pretty good, actually. Um, the final showdown in this movie sucks. The fact yeah. that it's a physical fight with a clown. I mean, they're not going to do the ritual of chut. There's a whole thing in the book where you have to like bite the tongue of evil and follow it into space and make it laugh. It's a lot, dude. He, Stephen King was on mountains of crack cocaine. I don't think it was crack. You I just to, think it was regular yeah. coke. But still. Answer these riddles three from the Eggman and the yeah, Walrus. pretty much. <laughs> it's, it is bananas. So I understand why they didn't do that. But I hate the fact that it's just like, Let's like take just turns. Not Let's survive. take turns punching this physical manifestation right. of intangible evil, and right. somehow that will defeat it. That's so stupid. Now, I love the I love the interpretation of because the big thing is like the belief of children is what makes them so powerful to fight him. And so when he aims the gun, and Mike's like, it's empty, but it still hurts Pennywise. That's very good. And and I could have used more of a fight along those lines. Like for instance. In the book, Eddie's inhaler is very important. He realizes it's a placebo in the book, but still chooses to like summon his belief of a child. Uh, I believe the term is placenta. Yeah, his placenta. Yeah, it's the placenta effect. And he he blasts Pennywise with his inhaler. And it reacts oh, like that's acid. Fun. Because he yeah, believes that it's potent. Cool. You know what I mean? Like there's stuff like that yep. that they could have done here instead of like a little bit of lost boys. Punch action. and stab yeah. and punch and stab and punch and stab. Like, I don't know. Yeah. It just doesn't work for yeah. me. Yeah. I feel like this this movie was pretty oversold to me how scary it was. I remember at the time it's it not came out to me except for painting lady it's not at all. It's not oversold to you? No, not scary. Oh, it's not scary. Yeah. No, I I think it's not even a little scary. Like it, it was completely completely oversold to me. I was like, dude, you'll never want to go to the circus again after you see this clown. Well, first of all, I don't want to go I, anyway. Already there. Who are you hanging out with? <laughs> second of all, already just, there. It just, so. it so doesn't <laughs> hang together for me. It's like, it's less than the sum of its parts, I think. I don't know. I, I have perhaps a spicy opinion on this movie and that'll come out, I think, later when we rate it. <laughs> I think it is a... um I think it's influenced by what's going on in horror during these those really important like four or five years for horror coming back. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, we've got Get Out is happening yeah. around this time. Big horror stuff is happening that's good. It's not just your typical like, oh, it must be close to October. We're getting all these trailers right. in August right. for these scary movies. So I think it, there's probably, it, it feels like there's some irony that, Last night I was teaching about groupthink in one of the classes that I teach because it also feels like it's this kind of because everybody says it this too. Oh, but also this is a thing. Yeah, you know. So it kind of almost feels like it's a mm -hmm. product of a, a perfect mm -hmm. storm. I agree. That benefited the movie ultimately, or how it's a straight it approached. Yeah, straight it. Here at Two Chunks and a Hunk, we've developed the perfect way to break movies. It's the scientific cinema scale, and it is flawless and as follows. The best thing we can ever say about a movie is buy it. Nope. nope. Own it. <laughs> Don't lend it. Buy, buy that, that poster. poster. <laughs> buy, the, buy the novel in hardcover and to put it on your nightstand. Joke's on you. I have the paperback. The next Ooh. best thing is buy it. That's followed by rent it. After that is stream it. And then forget it. And last but certainly least, the worst thing we could ever say about a movie. God hath forsaken us. I'm going to go first real quick. Real quick. I dunked all over it. I stand by my dunks. Still, it really is a fun movie. Like a carnival haunted house type situation. Um, the Fast and Furious of horror movies. So... My official two chunks rating of this movie is stream it. If you are a fan of the book, it has to be a forget it. But mm. my official stamp of Jordan approval rating is stream it. I'm going to stream it too. And a lot of it had to do with I'd seen it before and was excited to find out I didn't have to rent it uh, when I was watching it again. <laughs> it was kind of like, okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> Because uh, there's stuff too, whether it's something I haven't heard of, or at least I've heard that it does, it's not a good movie that I'm still excited to rent. Like, sure. well, 
Yeah. That's fine though. And then there's like occasionally the ones that you're like, oh, but do I want this in my library? Probably. Can't believe it's not here yet. <laughs> but this was definitely happy to stream. And that's that's my rating. It's a stream for me. Yeah. I'm going to forget this movie. Um, I think it was pretty massively oversold to me as a great scary clown movie. I think, I think at its best, this is a movie that you put on your TV while you're having a Halloween party. But I think in reality, I would not pause Monster Mash long enough to play this movie at my Halloween party. <laughs> and so I'm going to forget it. Dosh, have you seen part two? I have not seen part two because I did not like part one. Well, it's an interesting conversation too. I would say that yeah. part one almost becomes more worth a watch so that you can watch part two because some of the, I mean, the performance from, I mean, the cast is just stacked in part two. Yeah, it's so. a great cast. It's a little more compelling. I think that's interesting though. To, and it to dives a little it, more into the cosmic horror, just a smidge. Well, to think of it in terms of like revisionism, in terms of like a, a not great movie has a sequel that makes the first one better. Did we give right. that first one a free pass? No, to I don't move think up so. in our ratings, you know. I, don't, I think I, I mean, don't think it, but I don't think it gives it a free pass, but I think it gives it an asterisk. Like sure. a like a this, so for me, I would say like this movie is a stream it. Yeah. Um, but if you're planning on watching it in conjunction with the second, then I would say it is necessary. So that's the interesting thing though, because like I think Deathly Hallows part one is not that great. Sure. And I think part two is really pretty good. Yeah. But that that bumps up the the appeal of Deathly Hallows part one in my mind. So it's just, it's interesting how those can kind of, the partnership of like a good sequel to a not great first one. Sure. Well, it's like you, you can't, can, can bump you it up. can't get on the highway without the on-ramp, right? Like, yeah, I guess so. Like it's got to be, it's got to be your your build up into the thing that you're actually interested in. Yeah, right. Next week, Dune. <laughs> Next week, Dune. Next week, Dune. Then week after us, it Dune us. And then yeah. after, and then after that, guys. Who knows? I don't know. I don't. I want to say it, but I'm not gonna say it. You should get ready for our. Home. A theme built off our affinity for Roll Doll. <laughs> <laughs> Just in time for the season. BFG, James and the Giant Peach, Willy Wonka, it, that's it. Our new series called Wonka This Way. Walk This mm. Way. <laughs> that's very good. It's, See, it's funny because that's a believable title that we would actually choose for a series. <laughs> it's, a, it's a back and forth. It's an AB series where we do one we, Willy Wonka adaptation and then one documentary about big trucks and it's Wonka this way, Tonka this way. Oh, yes. And then we close it out with Armageddon to get our Aerosmith. <laughs> Don't want to miss a thing just, in there. Just because the whole time we've been teasing, so it's only fair. It's only yep. fair. We give the people what they want. It's only it's only fair, fair space. Oh my. We got to be done. <laughs> to end today's episode, we I'd like for totally you to say Stephen our names. Stephen King to the ending here. And we, yeah, really? No, it would just end right <laughs> now. If that was, if we were Stephen King in the ending, it would be like, and, and everything's fine. Or, or is, it? is it? Yeah. <laughs> to end today's episode, I'd like for each of us to say our names and what it would manifest as to freak us out. Childhood horror, right? That's the thing. The biggest childhood scare of your life. That's well, what it becomes. So in the book, the whole thing is that kids are easier to scare the because adult fears. The whole thing is that fears. kids are easier to scare because adult fears. Let's take like some time ethereal. to consider They're too ethereal. Adults are more afraid of intangible things and kids are scared of monsters under their beds. <laughs> <laughs> like, how does, how does it turn into like... A, co a call from a collections agency, you know? Like, it's got to be <laughs> something tangible. But yeah, no, let's go with, like, the childhood thing it would have turned into. For two junks and a hunk, my name is Jordan Wonders, and it would have been Heffalumps and Woozles, uh, which I feel like I've talked about a weird amount on this show. Yeah, <laughs> we've talked about Heffalumps and Woozles a lot. I'm Doge, and another thing we've talked about a lot is how it would turn into Willem Dafoe's Green Goblin busting yeah. through Aunt May's window <laughs> and saying, finish it. We are just <laughs> saying, deliver us from evil. Uh, we have finish done it. Different yeah. versions of this. I'm realizing now we have done like five different versions of this closing to this episode. <laughs> yeah, totally. I think we did this with a Boggart. Yeah, I think so. You're probably right. I'm Carter and it would be Methodists. <laughs> Oh! <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> Wait, oh my, oh my God. Oh, they're baptizing a baby. Oh my God. What are their There's- choir people wearing? <laughs> they're at the liquor store <laughs> in town? <laughs> I only get to say I feel like dancing. I don't get to actually do it. What on earth? Some coffee's fast, but not fresh. Some coffee's fresh, but only after a long wait. Speedway coffee is made fresh at the push of a button, hot or iced, so you can have fresh coffee your way, right away. Get two times the points when you buy any size hot or iced coffee drink with Speedy Rewards. Hear that? Is that America cheering or a sausage patty sizzling to perfection? It's time to cheer for Egg McMuffin and fresh cracked eggs at McDonald's. It's time to wake up to the aroma of freshly baked biscuits and treat yourself to a real honest-to-goodness morning meal. Breakfast, it's on at McDonald's. Now enjoy a large iced coffee for just two bucks and a breakfast sandwich to make a meal. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal. 